I Hey Tony. Hey Jeff, how's it going? It's going well. Good, good, good. Hi Jim. Uh, do you want to uh, start us off, uh, Tony, and I'll uh, jump right in, but maybe make a bridge from last Friday? No, it's okay. You can go. I, 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 I finished last Friday. Yeah, on, we did Aquinas. Yeah. Very good. All right, everybody. Thanks. Uh, good, good to see everybody. Any uh, topics uh, before I get started? Questions or concerns? We talked about uh, economics as a choice last time, about making good choices, presumably choices uh, for the good of uh, an individual and for the good of society, uh, and also some of the challenges of making good choices because we're not necessarily hardwired to be uh, even uh, doing the best for ourselves, much less for others. And so the question of making wise choices is a perennial question. The idea of the Greeks of uh, the need of a virtue, an excellence of that they called phronesis, to be able to make wise choices is a fundamental uh, idea that uh, carries through 2,000 years of thinking about uh, human nature, uh, about uh, our tendencies to mess up, even for ourselves, and to create conflicts with others. We're gonna continue to revisit those issues of economic choices, whether in the marketplace, uh, as uh, individuals, and today more about economic choices as citizens, when we think about uh, our role in a democracy, uh, at least in helping to design uh, social institutions, uh, social institutions for the good, uh, for the good of individuals, for the common good, presumably, as we will try to uh, elaborate uh, today and in future lectures. Today, I want to talk about the uh, basic question of private property uh, as an institution, uh, as a, uh, uh, a social construction uh, that uh, enables people to use uh, material goods uh, or to uh, choose how they use their, own, we use our own time, I should say, uh, in uh, uh, selling our time as workers uh, or as using our time in other ways and what uh, choices we have around property in terms of uh, the design of property rights for our own benefit and for uh, the public good or the common good. This is a topic that will take us through many, many weeks of discussion. So today I'm going to mainly highlight that there are a number of different ideas about property that have been debated really for the last 2,500 years in the Western world. And if uh, we, if I knew uh, the philosophical history of other parts of the world, uh, even uh, in a rudimentary way, I'm sure we would find the same debates taking place in other parts of the world as well. But in Western thought and Western politics, the debates about property, about inequality, about responsibilities to the poor have been perennial questions, sometimes uh, grouped under the rubric of social justice. And there are many, many competing views about social justice and therefore about the nature of property and the nature of inequality 
whether it's a good thing, a bad thing, an inevitable thing, uh, an ill, a benefit, what I want to do today is introduce you to a number of thinkers, or if you've already studied some of them, to reintroduce you to uh, these thinkers and to open up for us a uh, range of ideas that will carry through throughout the course, uh, because the different visions of how property should work in society really uh, shape economic uh, views about the economy and views about economic ethics fundamentally. So I'll start with, uh, as usual, uh, let me share a slide and uh, we'll spend the day talking about different theories of property and social justice and uh, the idea is to really get us started um, in a discussion that will last throughout the course. Now, let me give us the full screen. I hope everybody can see that. And to start, justice itself is a big term with lots of different meanings, and it's uh, I think uh, useful to start with a basic uh, set of categories of justice. Distributive justice is the term uh, used to denote uh, the justice in how uh, material goods and services and well being generally are distributed within a society. Corrective justice uh, is the uh, area of concern uh, involved with the violations of justice and how they can be corrected uh, through uh, penalties, uh, through restitution, uh, and through uh, other social devices, punishment and, uh, and, uh, and restitution. Procedural justice is the area of uh, ethics concerned with process for example, due process under the law or equal treatment under the law. Our focus is uh, today mainly on the issues of distributive justice, but inevitably we will see that all of these areas of justice are part and parcel of the economics debate uh, to have an economy that functions for human well-being we need an economy that uh, addresses all three of these dimensions of justice. Well, there are many different theories of uh, economic justice and distributive justice in particular. Uh, I list them here. I'm going to talk about them during this hour. Uh, and uh, these very different theories have very different implications for how we think about property, how we think about inequality in society, uh, how we should view the uh, coexistence of massive wealth and uh, pervasive poverty uh, in, in the world at the same time. Is that a matter of concern? Is that a matter of indifference? Is that uh, natural or uh, something to be remedied? And depending on which of these many theories, and I give some of the, uh, some of the proponents of these alternatives uh, in parentheses here, uh, you get quite different answers to this question. Let me emphasize as we talk about income and wealth and how it is distributed, whether equally or unequally in society, in fact, in real economic life, there are many ways that individuals uh, have access to income or wealth or goods and services. Uh, one way is through market transactions. Uh, and that is that uh, we engage in work and uh, earn 
a salary or wages as a result of work, or we uh, trade uh, property, uh, engage in exchange. And that is one way that the distribution of uh, income and wealth is determined. Sometimes in economics courses, it's considered to be basically the only way that income and wealth are determined. Another way is uh, various kinds of gift giving, uh, voluntary exchange, charity, philanthropy, uh, and so on as another way that uh, individuals gain access to basic uh, or gain access to, uh, to goods and services. Uh, I left out a major, <laughs> absolutely fun, oops, fundamental uh, category, but I'm not able to edit it right now. Uh, and that is uh, transfers within families, uh, which is one of the most important determinants of the distribution of income and wealth in any society in history, including our own. Another way that uh, we gain access to income, wealth, goods, or services is through the provision by government. Uh, and again, this has been true as long as there has been civilization, roughly the last 10,000 years, where governments may provide services of roads and infrastructure, uh, or uh, public school or public health, uh, and uh, often uh, governments finance these uh, services that are provided through taxes. So the question of the right organization of public finance, that is the taxation and the use of those taxes for public services and public investments is a fundamental question of uh, economic justice. Uh, another mode of access is the commons, uh, that there are common resources, uh, environmental resources uh, are uh, a, a case where we gain access to them by taking them, by going out in a fishing boat and fishing, uh, or going into the woods and uh, chopping down uh, firewood or collecting fruits and vegetables. Um, so the commons uh, throughout history has provided one means for gaining access to goods and services. And the enclosure of the commons as private property, uh, in other words, uh, an area that is held in common and then is turned into property of individuals has been one of the great flashpoints of history, of economic uh, conflict throughout history. Uh, another method of distribution of uh, income and wealth is, uh, is taking. I listed re uh, revolutions, but uh, theft uh, and uh, other kinds of, uh, of uh, forcible taking, war, conquest, uh, would be part of the distribution of income and wealth. Suffice it to say that uh, the question of markets as uh, central to income distribution is very much part of modern society, but we shouldn't lose uh, focus on the fact that market institutions, private property and their use and their exchange is only one part of the determination of economic justice and economic institutions. And indeed, uh, a critical point is that provision of government services in modern society is a, a comparable instrument for ensuring a kind of distribution of income and wealth that uh, attends to the common good. In other words, we should never just settle for the market distribution of income as the uh, necessary uh, endpoint of income distribution. We have choices. Uh, and uh, in the case of 
uh, the design of property rights. We're talking about societal choices. Uh, we're talking about political choices, uh, not only individual choices. We're often talking about economic reform, uh, ways to make things better. And uh, the question throughout history in the debates over proposals of reform is, do reforms make things better or will they make things worse? And of course, there are, are reforms that go awry, reforms that don't function well, uh, and reforms that uh, sometimes have uh, a marvelously beneficial outcome. Uh, one of the wonderful uh, books uh, in modern times about the debates over reform is by a, a late uh, professor of economics at Harvard, who was a, a briefly a, a teacher of mine uh, when I was there as a student a long time ago, Albert Hirschman, uh, a great uh, social thinker who wrote a book called The Rhetoric of Reaction. Reaction meaning reactionary in this case, reacting against reform proposals. And he warned that uh, in debates over reform, there is a ready-made uh, toolkit of reaction against reform proposals, which he put into three categories, the arguments of futility, perversity, and jeopardy. So he said, whenever you make a reform proposal, you'll hear three attacks. Uh, the attack based on futility is, ah, that reform can't work. Uh, the uh, criticism based on perversity is, ah, you think you're going to do something good for the poor. It's actually going to make them worse, not better. And the argument based on jeopardy is, well, you could do that reform but you will jeopardize a larger goal if you do that. I wanted to raise Hirschman's classification because we will talk about the debates over reforms, uh, reforms of property rights or reforms of income distribution. And we will often see these arguments of futility, perversity and jeopardy made. They are the standard toolkit of reaction uh, of uh, resistance to reform. Now, just to get us warmed up, uh, I wanna talk about the distribution of income in the United States, but we're going to have a whole uh, week devoted just to the determinants of income distribution. So today I'm just uh, skimming the surface and uh, giving you a few basic ideas. And to do this, I'm relying on a recent uh, survey report by uh, the Pew Research Center. And I put this paper into uh, the readings for us and it will somehow get uh, into your, uh, your e-box uh, um, appropriately. So in this uh, Pew study, they, uh, the, the researchers classify households into three different categories, what they call an upper income category, a middle income category, and a lower income category, just for convenience. And they say that middle income or the middle class are households whose average, whose annual income is either two thirds below or two thirds of the median up to twice the median. So if you are anywhere between two thirds of the median income, the middle income of households up to twice the middle income of households, that's the middle class. Households above that, uh, above that double the median income are called upper class and households that have less than two thirds of the median income are in this uh, study treated as lower income households. And as of 2019, by this categorization, uh, the upper income households are 20% of the population, the middle income households are 51% of the population, and the lower income households are 29% of the population as of 2019. The 
point of this graph is that in the United States over the last 50 years, we've had a decline of the middle class, more wealth at the top and more poverty at the bottom. So the United States in 1970 by uh, this Pew study classification had 62% of American households in the middle class, but that had gone down to 43% of households uh, as of 2018. I'm sorry, let me strike that. Not the number of households, the share of the national income of household income was 62% in middle income households in 1970. But by 2018, the share of the total income received by the middle income households had declined to 43%. The share of household income accruing to the top income <coughs> households had risen to 48% to nearly half, even though they are only 20% of the households. And for the lower income, which constitutes 29% of households, by 2018, they were receiving only 9% of the income, down slightly from 10%. The point is that there has been a widening of inequality in the United States during the past 50 years. And the same point is made in this graph, all of which uh, come from the Pew study, this looks at households according to quintiles. So the bottom fifth, or the uh, if you divide households into the poorest fifth, second poorest uh, quintile, uh, the middle quintile, the fourth quintile, and the top 20% of households, uh, you can look at the uh, rise of income for households of those uh, quintiles at different time periods. And what we learn from that is that the uh, richest households have had the fastest rise of income throughout the period since 1981. That's another way to say the same thing as the previous slide, which is that the rich have gotten richer uh, than, uh, the, than the poor have gotten richer. In fact, the poor have suffered absolute declines of income, uh, many poor households, and the rich have had, on average, very significant increases of income. Wealth is even more unequally distributed. Income is the flow of earnings in a year. Uh, Wealth is the stock of uh, assets that are owned uh, by uh, a household, net of the debts or liabilities of that household. So wealth is the total bank account and ownership of real estate and stocks uh, and other, uh, uh, other assets minus uh, whatever debts the households have. And in general, in modern societies, wealth is much more unequally distributed than income. Uh, so the ownership of the stock market, uh, which we uh, hear about uh, new records being set every day, is overwhelmingly owned by a small part of the American population. 10% of uh, Americans own 90% of the stock market wealth, for example. And what this graph shows is that the share of total wealth that is owned by the upper income households has increased significantly from 1983 to 2016 and from 2016 to 2021 uh, that uh, curve has continued to rise. The share of total national wealth accruing to the middle and lower income households has continued to, uh, has uh, shrunk 
between 1983 and 2016. Again, US societies become less equal both in income distribution and in the distribution of wealth. When we study this in more detail uh, in a later class, we'll talk about the different theories as to why the income inequality has widened and the wealth inequality has widened. But suffice it to say for us now, this is a major change in American society during the past half century. And it has occurred in other uh, countries as well, though in the United States to a very significant extent. Uh, it's notable that US inequality is among the highest in the world and very high compared to other high income countries like Canada or the United Kingdom or the countries of the European Union or Japan. So countries that have high incomes, if you compare the distribution of income in those societies, the United States is one of the most unequal of uh, all of the high income countries in the world. There is a group of countries, I think it's 35 countries now, uh, that are the high income democracies with some few developing countries uh, also in the group called the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And this is a measure of inequality in the OECD countries. The website uh, is provided there for you. And the arrow points to the United States, which shows one of the highest uh, levels of inequality among all of these high income countries. And in fact, if you look at the few countries that have even uh, more inequality than the United States, those four countries are Bulgaria, Mexico, Chile, and Costa Rica. Uh, not any of them a high income country. So the United States has the highest income inequality of any of the high income countries in the OECD. Notably, the next country uh, that is of high income inequality next to the United States is the United Kingdom. That is not a coincidence because the United Kingdom and the United States share both a history and an ideology that has guided the economic uh, systems in both countries. Both the United Kingdom and the United States rely more on market institutions and private property for the distribution of income than do most of the other countries in the OECD. And therein lies a tale. The market economy produces inequalities of wealth and income, whereas other institutions such as government provision of health care or education narrows the inequality. The particular measure of inequality shown in this graph is the Gini coefficient. Don't worry about it right now. We will study that when we come to the week devoted to the question of income inequality. Well, since we're talking about choice, it's important to ask, what do Americans say about this income inequality? And the Pew Research Center is a, a good place to turn because it is a, a a polling center to measure public opinion. And the basic conclusion that one finds from the Pew survey data is that most Americans think that income inequality is too high. In fact, in the uh, pie chart shown on the left here, 61% of Americans in the response to this survey say that there is too much economic inequality in the country today. But it's also important to understand that there is a big difference of opinion in the United States and the 
left-right political spectrum, so-called, is to some extent a reflection of that difference of views. More dem Democrats tend uh, more to say that there's too much inequality. Republicans on the right of the political spectrum tend to say that uh, there is not too much inequality. Uh, this is shown in the right-hand graph of that 61% for the survey respondents who are either Republican or lean Republican, tend to vote Republican, 41% say there's too much inequality, 43% say there's the right amount, and 12% says there's too little inequality. Whereas for the Democrats or those respondents who lean Democratic, tend to vote Democratic, they say that there are 78% of those say that there is too much inequality, 7% say the right amount, and 14% say too little. So Democrats tend to support income redistribution of one form or another to narrow inequality. Republicans, by and large, tend to oppose uh, that kind of redistribution. But with variation in both groups. And here you can see that even among the Republican or lean Republican respondents, it's about half and half uh, between those who say there's too much inequality and those who say it's the right amount. And this is a further amplification uh, of this, uh, which you can look at more closely. Again, the difference of Republicans and Democrats in terms of the policy response that they would like. Then one should ask, why does it matter? Uh, for those who say that inequality is too high, why is it too high? And the bar chart on the left of the screen gives some reasons why uh, people think the inequality is too high. The main reason, it limits people's opportunities. Another reason is it gives the wealthy too much political influence in America. 55% say because the inequality goes against our country's values. I'm not so sure often. And also there's a big uh, range of values in the United States. Uh, and then on the right-hand side are the theories that people hold of why there is so much inequality. Uh, the number one view is because of outsourcing of jobs to other countries. Uh, this is almost surely not the correct answer from an economic analytic point of view, but it is perceived to be the most important factor of income inequality. Uh, and that's partly because President Trump repeatedly claimed that it was the outsourcing of jobs to China that had created so much harm. And that was politically uh, a, a popular position, especially in 2016. So let me turn in the second half of uh, our hour together this morning to different theories about income distribution what it should be, and what that implies for property rights. A starting point for us is Christian thought. Uh, and uh, Christian thought also emerged from Jewish thought. In the Bible, it's clear uh, there is private property. Uh, there is ownership of land. There is uh, ownership of livestock. Uh, and uh, of other goods, and in uh, both the uh, Jewish laws uh, and uh, the uh, teachings uh, in the gospel, uh, there is a tremendous amount of discussion about private property uh, and about also social organization of property. And there's a basic idea uh, that is... Uh, part of both uh, Jewish thought and uh, Christian thought and uh, uh, Jesus's gospel teachings. And that is that 
God created the world for all, for all of humanity. And in uh, Christian social teachings, this is uh, the doctrine of the universal destination of goods, that the earth was created for all people. And that poses a question, and it's posed a practical challenge to that view. If the earth is created for all, why does Jeffrey Bezos have $200 billion of it and hundreds of millions of people have none of it? Uh, where is the universal destination of goods in an economy of vast inequality? And of course, uh, both the Jewish and Christian teachings have said a lot about this over the last 2,500 years. And perhaps the most, uh, one of the most uh, striking and notable teachings in this regard is uh, Matthew 25, uh, where Jesus teaches uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, attending to the needs of the poor is attending uh, to, uh, to Jesus and to the good. Uh, and he says uh, that in the, uh, uh, in, in the judgment, uh, people will be judged uh, on what they did for the least among the, uh, those who give uh, food to the hungry, those who uh, clothe the poor, those who visit the sick, uh, it is as if uh, they had done that unto me, says Jesus in Matthew 25. And this, of course, is a message about uh, social justice and a message about responsibility to the poor. Uh, the idea that there is a basic uh, uh, responsibility of individuals that will be the basis of uh, judgment, uh, in fact, of how each of us treats the poor. So this is not uh, in, in this direct teaching about, um, uh, uh, about government policy or fiscal policy or economic policy per se, uh, but about uh, individual responsibility. Uh, in the Catholic Church social teachings, uh, the view that derives from uh, this perspective of the universal destination of goods is that while private property is a, uh, an important uh, instrument of human well being because it enables. Uh, humanity to make uh, use of, uh, of creation in an effective way, it is bound by moral responsibilities. Uh, so even though there is private property, because this is part of the way that uh, hum humans uh, make use of the creation, uh, the Catechism of the Church says that the universal destination of goods remains primordial, uh, even though there is respect for private property. Uh, those who own the goods of production uh, are obliged to employ them in ways that will benefit the greatest number. So this is the basic idea that there is a moral responsibility to ownership. Those who hold goods for use and consumption should use them with moderation, reserving the better part for guests, for the sick, and for the poor. So it is a doctrine of private property because that creates the ability of humans to use the creation, but a responsibility of property within a moral framework, uh, reserving the use, the better part of uh, these goods and services for guests, for the sick, and for the poor. And uh, Pope Paul VI, in this remarkable encyclical in 1967, Popolorum Progressio, uh, has this striking uh, statement 
He says, everyone knows that the fathers of the church laid down the duty of the rich toward the poor in no uncertain terms. And then he quotes St. Ambrose of Milan. He says, St. Ambrose of Milan put it this way, quote, you are not making a gift of what is yours to the poor man, but you are giving him back what is his. You have been appropriating things that are meant to be for the common use of everyone. The earth belongs to everyone, not to the rich. So this is the basic idea of the universal destination of goods. Private property, yes, but responsibility of that property. And one version of that today is the sustainable development goals, the idea that there is a common responsibility to end poverty, to end hunger, to ensure universal access to healthcare, universal access to education, and so forth. And this, in a way, is a modern statement of uh, this universal destination of goods. It's not realized, but it is propounded as a global goal. A philosophical idea along the same lines uh, came from a well-known philosopher. Many of you may have read part of his famous book, The Theory of Justice, uh, written, I think, in 1971, if I remember correctly, where he asked the question, suppose that we are each making choices about how our society should operate, but we're doing so behind a veil of ignorance, meaning that we know how the society will work. We just don't know which person in that society we will be. Will we be a poor person? Will we be a rich person and so forth? How should we want that society to be organized so that when the veil of ignorance is lifted and we find out who we are and what our role in society is, we're living in a place that is a decent place to live. And Rawls' argument is that if we are choosing the rules of the game, not knowing which role we will play, whether we'll be the beggar or whether we'll be Jeffrey Bezos, uh, we would want to create a society of relative equality or at least of well-being for the least among us. Uh, and he argues that uh, risk-averse individuals will say, make the least off as well off as possible, uh, not necessarily strict equality because that could uh, ruin society for everybody, but make sure that the poor are not suffering and that their position is as good as can be practically made. And Rawls argues that that is uh, a just position for the management of property. So private property, yes, but within boundaries of taxation, regulation, and redistribution of income so that nobody is suffering too much. Another uh, very important uh, uh, example of trying to implement this idea, I would say it's also a reflection in a deep way of uh, Jewish and Christian teaching, though it's a universal document, was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted in 1948 in the early days of the United Nations. And it says in article one, that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and in rights. That is uh, really a Christian doctrine uh, in some sense. It's the Western philosophical doctrine of equality in dignity and rights. It found resonance uh, in philosophies in Asia, in Confucianism, and in other uh, Asian philosophies. So this became a universal declaration. And the Universal Declaration held that because of that common dignity, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care. Well, you can see a lot of American politicians have not read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights very recently. But the idea is that because of the universal destination of goods, 
though not put in its theological form, put in a secular form, equal dignity, everybody has the right to meet basic economic needs and society should be organized along those lines. Now, one, I, I would tend to stop there and say, that's a nice idea. Uh, we all have dignity, we're all human beings, we all should be able to meet our basic needs, we should care for the poor. And yet, most of our societies are not like that, uh, or not, uh, not, not uh, expressing these values. And the fact of the matter is there is a very wide range of values about social justice and very different values uh, that have been propounded over time. And it's important for us to understand that much wider range of values. I need to do so because I, found, I find that this first set of values so attractive and appealing that I need to be reminded it's definitely not uh, the unanimous view, and it's not the view embedded in modern economics. The view embedded in modern economics is uh, this view expressed here, that liberty should be preeminent and property belongs to those who can best use it. And this is an idea that finds reflection in many thinkers, John Locke, Adam Smith, Herbert Spencer, a 19th century uh, so, social thinker, Robert Nozick, a 20th century philosopher who was a colleague of John Rawls. So the idea of this second variant is that it's not equality and help for the poor that we want, it is freedom because Freedom is the natural right of human beings. Ah, a lot to talk about with time running out, but John Locke is probably the main uh, philosophical base of this view. John Locke wrote at the end of the 17th century. Uh, his most famous work is the Second Treatise on Government, written in 1690. Uh, and he grapples with, with this problem. He says, God, who has given the world to men in common, has also given them reason to make use of it to the best advantage of life and convenience. So he says that to do that requires private property. Well, that's also the church's social teachings up to that point, that the earth is given in common, uh, yet private property is a necessary way to use that common inheritance. So Locke asked the question, how does the common become the private? How does the creation for everybody become private property? And he says that it becomes private property because the one thing we own is our own selves our own effort, our own freedom, our own labor. So he says, when we mix our labor with nature to plow the land, to chop down a tree, to collect fruits from the trees, we are taking the common good and possessing it privately by mixing it with our own labor, which is ours. And Locke created a theory of property around this idea of appropriating the common good through private labor. And I'd like you to read chapter five of the second treatise on government. It's just a few pages, but among the most influential and famous pages of philosophy. And he describes this idea. But from there, Locke really goes to town because he says, not only do we gain private property that way, but because we own our own labor, no one has the right to take our property from us. No one else can take it, and the government can't take it. In fact, the reason for government, according to Locke, is to protect our private property, nothing else. 
And in fact, if the government tries to take our private property, it's violating our natural rights. So Locke <laughs> has this uh, remarkable construction where he starts from the common creation, turns it into private property, and then adds another fascinating element of tremendous influence in Anglo-American society. And that is to say, not only do we own our private property, nobody, not even the government, can take it from us. And Lockeans today, who are called libertarians, say if the government tries to tax us, that is like slave labor for us. Uh, there is no right of the government because that is ours. And so this is the alternative to the common responsibility or the moral responsibility of private property. It puts private property as the highest objective because private property, according to Locke, is a reflection of private right to one's own labor. Uh, and so this is the clever twist of Locke's theory. He does remarkable twists and turns with it, some of which are profoundly pernicious in my view. Uh, Locke actually was quite involved in colonial enterprises in uh, the Americas. Remember, this is 1690. He and his patron, the Earl of Shaftesbury, uh, were shareholders of uh, property in the Carolinas. And Locke argued that not only is there the right to property, but there is the right to dispossess the Native Americans because the Native Americans are not properly mixing their labor with the land. In Locke's theory, property comes from putting human labor into land. But according to Locke, who never went to America anyway, uh, uh, in, uh, Native Americans didn't do that. They just hunted and gathered and they did not make good use of the land. And so Locke extraordinarily says it is the right of tillers of the land to take the land uh, because they make better use of it. And he writes that he who encloses land and gets more of the conveniences of life from 10 cultivated acres than he could have had from 100 left to nature can truly be said to give 90 acres to mankind. Uh, for his labor now supplies him with provisions out of 10 acres that would have needed 100 uncultivated acres lying in common. So Locke creates a philosophy that says, not only can we take away the land, but that's for the good of humankind because we're more productive and we're therefore adding to the stock of well-being. You can see he doesn't give too much attention to what happens to the people whose land is taken away. He just takes the aggregate sum and says, since it's higher, we are making a, a gift to humanity. But certainly uh, the uh, colonialists who appropriated Native American land did not give their surplus back to the Native Americans. <laughs> they drove the Native Americans uh, into reservations or into uh, uh, destitution and uh, uh, even genocide uh, in, in the end. But Locke has this uh, remarkable mix of ideas, how private property emerges from the common good, why government can't touch it, and why there is a right to appropriate that land. It becomes a philosophy that today we call libertarianism, which says private property is sacrosanct. That is the moral is the private property because that reflects my freedom. Uh, and Adam Smith in a less uh, doctrinaire way uh, talks about how this is for the good because it leads to productivity. And uh, actually uh, he talks about the fact that not only 
does private property have Locke's principles of convenience attached to them or liberty or self-interest, but also they lead to the common good by raising the overall level of production in society as if by an invisible hand. So Adam Smith uses a phrase, invisible hand, which was a theological term of his time and of the preceding century to say that the market system has a natural law around it and operates benevolently, beneficently to produce well-being for all. <laughs> of course, it's an odd position when some people don't have property, when they are uh, in extreme duress uh, to be told that the invisible hand has made it so. But that is the philosophical position that Locke and Smith embodied. And in modern times, uh, Robert Nozick wrote an ingenious and to my mind, very frustrating book called Anarchy, State and Utopia, uh, also in the early 1970s, where he defined economic justice as a kind of procedural justice following Locke says, after goods become private property, the only test of economic morality of distribution is whether goods are then used according to the principles of liberty. That is voluntary transfer, voluntary contract. As long as people aren't forced to do anything, starting from a, a fair or a just appropriation of goods initially according to Lockean principles, then market exchange is the only uh, just way because people are left alone to decide what they want to do. Nozick does not give any credence to the fact that the result may be some people starving to death. If that's what happens through voluntary trade and market forces, so be it, according to Nozick. Uh, because for him, Again, the assumption is that voluntarism, freedom, liberty is the highest good, not meeting basic human needs or human dignity or the earth as viewed as something held by all. Another view is related, and that is the view that uh, nobody owes anybody else necessarily. Uh, what is owed is your own effort. Uh, and uh, you could see a, a Lockean twist to that. But interestingly, uh, one of the most quoted uh, defenses of the position is actually from Paul, from uh, Thessalonians 2, who in his epistle to the Thessalonians says, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. So this is uh, the first clear statement against uh, universal basic income that we have. Uh, it says you work for a living. Uh, and the idea is that uh, you have your own responsibility. Of course, one can find quotations in scriptures for many positions. And this is not consistent with the, I would say, the uh, gospel teachings, but it is a very often quoted view. And it finds its resonance in modern economic philosophy, which says you have the right to what you earn because what you earn is a measure of what you contribute to society. So if you earn $20,000 a year and you're poor, that's not a moral problem. That is a reflection of the fact that you as an individual contribute $20,000. Did I say 20,000? I hope so. If you make 20,000 uh, and you are poor, uh, 
that is a reflection of the fact that your contribution to society is $20,000. If you contributed more to society, you would earn more. And so this idea that what you earn is a measure of your social contribution, which I've loosely put uh, according to uh, Paul, St. Paul's uh, dictum of uh, if you don't work, you don't eat, uh, is a view of uh, modern economics that sometimes is held to be an ethical position, which is that uh, what is ethical about the market return is that what you earn is a reflection of the social value of your of your contribution. So this is another position that is taken. Now, there are, of course, also countless philosophies of inequality. The Jewish and Christian core teachings are philosophies of the equality, that all human beings are created in the image of God all have equal dignity. And if that's translated into modern secular terms, all have economic rights. But there are also philosophies of inequality, that people are not created equal, uh, that uh, inequalities in society reflect intrinsic inequalities across humanity. And there are many theories of inequality, deep theories. Uh, and they also go back throughout uh, philosophical history. Uh, and the human capacity to view other groups as inferior, or those who believe other gods as being inferior, or those of other races as inferior, is a profound a uh, uh, deep characteristic of humanity throughout uh, all of uh, known history. So theories of natural inequality among human beings are also theories that justify or try to justify, I should say, economic inequality. And it's Sad for me, but true that my favorite philosopher, Aristotle, gave uh, uh, to history one of these pernicious ideas among a vast number of wonderful ideas. But he gave the idea because he lived in a slaveholding society. He gave the idea that there was a condition in humanity of natural slavery that some people are by nature slaves because they don't rise to the level of rationality of free men. So he wrote, when, there, when then there is such a difference as that between soul and body or between men and animals, as in the case of those whose business is to use their body and who can do nothing better, the lower sort are by nature natural slaves. And it is better for them, as for all inferiors, that they should be under the rule of a master. For he who can be, and therefore is, another's, and he who participates in rational principle enough to apprehend but not to have such a rational principle is a slave by nature. Well, this is a uh, very unfortunate idea that became uh, part of Western civilization, which has been a slaveholding civilization throughout history. And Aristotle was quoted at many times in history in the American South, claiming that Africans were natural slaves or their descendants natural slaves, or in uh, famous debates uh, between Sepulveda and uh, uh, Las Casas uh, in uh, Spain in 1550, uh, where uh, one theologian argued that the indigenous populations of the Americas, 
whom uh, the Spaniards were conquering were natural slaves. Uh, and uh, they referred to Aristotle's ideas. Well, as you know, and as I hope you know and uh, will study, this kind of uh, view is deeply embedded in American society because the idea of white supremacy uh, throughout American history was a core tenet of a lot of uh, the white population in the United States. And it remains true until today. Uh, it's a pernicious uh, evil in my opinion, but it is a, a real viewpoint and it informs economic uh, attitudes and ideologies as well. So we shouldn't think that there's only the grand uh, philosophy of equality. There is also high philosophy of inequality as well and deep traditions of that. And then often finding expression in the most horrendous violence uh, that human beings inflict on other human beings in the name of natural inequalities. <clears throat> Part of this view, uh, also with other theological roots sometimes uh, appended to it, are that the poor are undeserving takers, that actually the rich don't exploit the poor, but the poor exploit the rich. And in America, a, uh, a novelist, uh, Ayn Rand, some of you may have uh, read her novels. Uh, they're kind of Hollywood potboiler novels, uh, but she considered herself a philosopher also, though philosophers certainly do not consider her a philosopher, uh, took the view that uh, the poor were not only undeserving, but they were exploiters of the rest of society. And she argued vociferously throughout her unhappy life, and uh, she gave unhappiness to many others, in my opinion, that, uh, that uh, we should not be altruistic or generous to the poor because that actually is a denial of our own selves, she said. Uh, she says that when you give to the poor, that is making a sacrifice. Uh, and then she asked the issue is whether man is to be regarded as a sacrificial animal. Any man of self-esteem will answer no. Altruism says yes. So she argues against altruism because she says that denigrates the human respectability. In other words, the poor are exploiting the rich and we should not let them do that. Herbert Spencer was another influential uh, writer of the late 19th century. He's the one who coined the phrase survival of the fittest. And in his view also, giving to the poor was an exploitation of the rest of society. He says the deserving poor are among those who are taxed to support the undeserving poor. And so <laughs> not only is there the view that uh, uh, private property is a right, but that uh, actually helping the poor contrary to Matthew 25, is an abuse of the rest of society because the poor are undeserving. And the view that largely has Puritan and Calvinist roots is that poverty is a sign of sin. It is not the result of social circumstances. It is the result of individual indolence or irresponsibility. And therefore, helping a poor person is not uh, making a just transfer or a respect of human dignity. 
Uh, it is a reward for sin. And that uh, puritanical or Calvinist view permeates the Anglo-American vision. Uh, and Herbert Spencer was uh, a key philosopher of that. John Locke, you'd be interested to know, also believed in locking up children as young as age three to force them to work rather than to beg on the same grounds that the poor are an abuse to society. Another view is that redistribution leads to tyranny. So this is a perversity argument to go back to uh, Albert Hirschman's classification. Uh, Hayek, uh, Friedrich Hayek, a Nobel laureate uh, libertarian economist at the University of Chicago in the latter part of his lifetime, argued in 1945 in a book called The Road to Serfdom that if we tried to help the poor, if we tried to have social justice, we will create an overpowerful state like uh, the Bolshevik Soviet state and the end result will be the loss of liberty. So it's not just that redistribution violates our liberty, the attempt to redistribute income, argued Hayek, leads to uh, uh, authoritarian or totalitarian rule. His famous book was that it leads to serfdom uh, by uh, uh, an overpowering state. It's a terrible theory because it has not been true uh, in any part of uh, modern life. Uh, other, one may argue whether the Bolshevik revolution was a reflection of this, but Hayek argued that this would be true in the United States or Europe uh, if there was an attempt at redistribution and yet the most redistributive countries of Europe, the Scandinavian countries are the ones that are routinely rated as having the most robust uh, democratic political systems of all of the countries of the world. There's another view that redistribution of income is simply infeasible or it will backfire. So this is the futility argument. And this is due to Robert, uh, Thomas Robert Malthus uh, and his followers. Malthus was the uh, proponent of the view that if there is help given to the poor, the poor will have more children and thereby create more poverty. So he took the view that helping the poor was self-defeating because it would only lead to even more poor people. There's a lot to be said about this, which we'll say when I have time, uh, it's empirically wrong, uh, and, uh, but very influential because it's an example of an argument that says it would be nice to help the poor, but we can't really do so because the side effects will make things even worse than they were before. And that was Malthus's position and it became highly influential. There's another view, sometimes uh, uh, also theologically given, which says that in this world, the world of fallen man, there's really nothing to do because men are sinners. Life is suffering. This was the uh, sin of Adam uh, upon future generations. And so all that we can really hope to do for our happiness uh, is to wait for uh, the future salvation for life everlasting. And of course, uh, Paul is also often quoted in this guise, but this is a philosophical point of view of many uh, theologies uh, uh, throughout history, which is don't expect improvement in this life look for improvement in salvation in, and justice in the next life. 
it's a theological argument of futility, if you will, not a Malthusian uh, argument of futility. Uh, finally, two more positions to mention, which we will come back to. Uh, the Marxist position is that inequality reflects not the uh, functioning of markets per se and the accidents of luck uh, or uh, the distribution of uh, ownership or skills, but results per se from exploitation. Marx and Engels reasoned that if the value of uh, goods and services results from the labor in them, then anyone that claims profit from workers must be taking something from the workers themselves. So Marx and Engels, using a Lockean labor theory of value, believed that the pure existence of profits is per se a evidence, an evidence of exploitation. And then Marx and Engels created a, a, a materialist theory of history, which held that exploitation will create so much suffering that it will lead to revolution, and that revolution is a historical necessity. So exploitation leads to crisis, and crisis leads to revolution, the communist revolution. And the final uh, view that I want to uh, share is the reformist idea uh, that is uh, most uh, often called social democracy. Uh, and its founder, uh, Edward Bernstein, was a contemporary of Marx uh, and uh, to some extent a follower, but also a critic because Bernstein said, we don't need a revolution, we need an evolution. And he wrote a book about evolutionary socialism rather than revolutionary socialism. And he uh, created the idea of social democracy. Uh, so he said that we must start from man's freedom as our moral base, but on that basis, of freedom, we can build a fairer society. And in his book, Evolutionary Socialism, he says that since poor people will be the voting majority in democracies, if we have a real democracy, we will have real reform. And he writes that it is thus no accident that the first country where, for example, a maximum hours per day was carried out was Switzerland. In other words, limiting the workday. He says the most democratically progressive country in Europe and democracy. And he says that therefore democracy can serve social purposes. So Bernstein said we can have gradual improvement through the work of government as long as the government is a democracy reflecting the will of the people. Let me stop here. We've uh, gone over time, but this is to introduce you to a lot of names, thinkers, and ideas. Some say human dignity. That means economic rights for all. Some say inequality. After all, humans are unequal and some deserve more than others. Some say freedom, no matter what follows, because that is our natural right. So don't take away from me what is mine. Some say revolution is the only answer. And some say democratic evolution is the answer. So this is a quick tour of a lot of uh, different approaches to property and social justice. Uh, don't despair of uh, how much I skimmed over uh, deep topics, because this is just an introduction to the topics that we're going to be speaking about for many weeks to come. Uh, I think I've gone too long. Uh, thanks for being patient and uh, see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, very good. Okay, we're all good. That was excellent. Did a phenomenal job getting through all that material. I will, uh, I'll, I'll drop that stuff in the Blackboard, Jesse, and uh, see you on Friday. Um, I'm also going to write to Fordham IT about getting um, that Dropbox updated. That's great. Yeah. I, I mean, I suspect that like. Wait, we'll see you Friday. Thank you, folks, very much. See you, Jim. See you. Bye. -bye. Thank this you. Is, and Barbara. Yes. And Barbara. Oh yeah, Barbara's Bye, Jim. there Bye, today. Barbara. See you. <laughs> off to the, we're off to the next Zoom. <laughs> Bye Bye. Right. Have, have fun. <laughs> Um, Tony, I was going to say that I suspect that Fordham IT will say you're on your own unless you like reach out to Michael or whoever is paying you 